really uneven sampling of, uh, of the oceans, and therefore this could just be a sampling issue. Um, but clearly there was a difference between what the observational record was saying about variability, particularly decadal variability, and what the model simulations were showing. But I think really the answer is instrumental, instrumental biases. Uh, XPTs, so expendable uh, instruments which measure the temperature of the upper ocean, uh, deployed by both research ship and merchant ships, uh, a significant part of the ocean observing system. And what uh, Gretzky and Kultemann uh, showed, uh, a clear bias between these instruments which is temperature, which is time dependent. Oops, sorry. Things always seem to happen. Uh, so here in the 1970s, the XPTs were measuring warm relative to the ocean and by significant amounts, uh, much smaller differences in the 1980s, early 1990s, and then again measuring warm uh, in the late 1990s. So it's really this uh, instrumental bias which is so dominant in the differences between the observational records and <coughs> model simulations. Uh, so Susan Waffles was the first to propose a correction to uh, this, the XPT biases, and that was consistent of uh, a, 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 time, a depth dependent temperature correction, uh, and it essentially was that these are free fall instruments falling through the water column. If you don't get the fall rate exactly right, then you're going to bias the temperature estimates. And that's what uh, she demonstrated. Uh, if you look at the differences between uh, CTD observations, which are the highly accurate observations, and deep XPTs, then the difference in temperature and also shallow XPTs is approximately linear with depth. That is, it was an error in the calculation of how quickly the instruments were falling through the water column. Uh, she proposed, proposed a correction to that. Um, the correction, the fall rate error shown here, for example, uh, for all the different ocean basins, there was a good agreement between the different ocean basins. Uh, it was time dependent, the peak in the 1970s and then much smaller after that. And it was different for different XBT types. Uh, there's now quite a cottage industry of uh, people trying to improve these corrections and they use both corrections in the fall rate area and absolute corrections in the thermistors and in, in the XPTs um, and there's a whole range of different corrections. I don't think the community has converged what is the, most, the best uh, as yet and that's largely because we are missing data, missing uh, data on instrument types, on how they are calibrated, etc. Uh, and it, it's an inevitable problem which uh, I don't think will be completely solved. However, this correction changes the estimates uh, significantly. Uh, so Katia Deminx was the first person to, to do this. Uh, and this shows the uh, Ishi and Levitas, the historical estimates that were available prior to that and Katia Deminck's new estimate based on the Susan Waffles uh, temperature correction, plus also a new mapping technique, uh, a reduced space optimal interpolation, which we used for mapping the sparse historical XPT data uh, onto a regular grid and providing global estimates. So the time series is very different. This hump in the 1970s is no longer present, but you do have this uh, variability, uh, which if you look at the right panel here, uh, both in ocean heat content on the top panel or on thermosteric sea level, so thermal expansion as a result of a warming ocean, uh, then the models with um, uh, volcanic forcing in both of these are for 700 metres, there's a good temporal agreement about the location, the timing of these uh, dips in the ocean heat content, which are directly related to the volcanic eruptions of Mount Agong, uh, El Chichon, and Pinatubo. The, the agreement is uh, by no means perfect. 
uh, but significant improvement on where we were previously. So that's uh, those temperature records were focused on the upper 700 metres of the ocean, uh, but we're also seeing uh, ocean warming throughout the full depth. Uh, this shows a repeat section in the South Atlantic from 1989 to 2014. So this is where a research ship uh, trans, uh, transverses the same part of the ocean, measuring top to bottom temperatures and lots of other properties uh, separated by decades. And so we see the warming in the upper ocean, which is the largest part of the heat content, of course. You also see this heat penetrating deep into the... Uh, uh, ocean, uh, particularly in the Atlantic Basin, travelling northward, uh, so you see this deep warming in the Brazil Basin. It's not, not large, but it's a very large volume of water, so it's a very significant amount of heat that is being uh, uh, taken up by the ocean here. <coughs> uh, Perky and Johnson have uh, used repeat sections from the Well Ocean Circulation Experiment and earlier observations and uh, there's an ongoing program of repeat sections uh, to try and map this horizontally. And you see that the largest uh, changes are in the Southern Ocean, so they're emanating from the Southern Ocean, <coughs> propagating north through the Atlantic, uh, into the Pacific, and into the Atlantic, uh, into the Indian, I'm sorry. Um, the amount of heat, well, here I've shown it in terms of ocean thermal expansion, so about 0.1 millimetres per year contribution to ocean thermal expansion. So that's uh, something like uh, 5 to 10 per cent of the uh, amount of sea level rise over this period. Uh, it's a very significant amount of heat. And the amount of heat uptake by the ocean is increasing over time. This is a simulations, a series of simulations using the uh, CMIP-5 uh, results are uh, showing the changes in ocean heat content uh, from 1860 to the present. Uh, about half of the ocean heat content increase occurred uh, by about 1997, with the other half occurring since then. Uh, so the light blue here is the upper ocean in the simulations. Uh, the dark blue, seven, or the intermediate colors, 700 to 2,000 meters, and from 2,000 meters to the bottom. Uh, so all of those increasing and increasing more rapidly uh, through the period. So in the uh, fifth assessment report, we pulled together, um, perhaps for the first time, I think, a full energy balance observational estimate of the energy balance of the Earth system uh, through both our chapter, the oceans chapter, plus also the radiative forcing chapter, uh, as well as um, our chapter on sea level. Uh, this shows the ocean or the total heat uptake by the climate system from 1970 to the present. Um, so 1970 up to 2011, I think we went at the time. Uh, upper ocean, zero to 700 metres in the ocean, light blue. Deep ocean, dark blue. And these are units of zeta joules, so that's something like 270 zeta joules. Uh, 270 by 10 to the 21 joules of heat absorbed over this period. Uh, the white is the amount of heat going into melting ice, both uh, sea ice and ice on land. Uh, the orange is the amount going into the land and being uh, taken up and penetrating down into the earth. And the red sliver along the bottom, which you may or may not be able to see, is the amount of heat going to actually heat the atmosphere. I'll come back to that. Uh, so we really need a framework also for understanding what does this ocean heat uptake, what's the energy balance of the Earth, and, and how, how should we think about it? And that's shown in this equation. Uh, Jonathan Gregory has uh, really been the proponent of, uh, of developing these ideas and using them to understand uh, climate sensitivity and other issues. Uh, so we have a radiative forcing of the climate system, F, and that's balanced by a net heat flux into the, into the climate system, principally into the ocean, and a radiative response, alpha delta T, where alpha is the climate feedback parameter, 
and delta T is the change in surface te temperature. Uh, this alpha is uh, the, related to the effective climate sensitivity, which is in turn related to the equilibrium climate sensitivity, um, but not directly since the uh, effective climate sensitivity uh, varies with, with time. So with this framework, you can actually look at um, uh, the energy balance again. So now we have the radiative forcing of the climate system shown on the left. Um, greenhouse gas, uh, the amount of energy flowing into the Earth system over the same period, 1970 to 2011, uh, roughly 1,200 zettajoules uh, from greenhouse gases. Uh, uh, principally well-mixed greenhouse gases, short-lived greenhouse gases in blue, uh, changes in solar forcing, much smaller component, uh, land use changes, much smaller, volcanic uh, eruptions, a negative forcing resulting in offsetting some of the warming from uh, greenhouse gases, and of course aerosols, and I presume uh, Steve spoke about aerosols and all the details of this diagram on, on Monday. I'm sorry I missed your talk, Steve. I should have come and learned. <laughs> um, and the sum of those is shown by the black curve here with about 800 zettajoules uh, stored in the climate system or entering the climate system over this period. Uh, and that's balanced by the storage in the ocean, about 270 uh, zettajoules. So it's a, roughly a third of the total energy that should be flowing into the system and radiation back to space uh, through the, the climate feedback uh, parameters. And uh, so this indicates that the uh, alpha should be somewhere between 2.4, uh, 2.5 and 1.2 uh, watts per meter squared per degree Celsius. Uh, ocean heat content should be a very good uh, tool for evaluating our, our climate models. Uh, and this shows the uh, attempt to do that, uh, something we published in the ARL uh, in 2013 and was in the last IPCC report, comparing ocean thermal expansion. You can do exactly the same for ocean heat content. It's only a, a coefficient difference between heat content and, and thermosteric sea level, uh, shown in blue. And all the model simulations from the CMIF-5 exercise um, the observations going from 1970 up to the present. There's actually quite good agreement between the observational record and the average of the models. However, there's a very broad spread in the models and also a very broad spread in the observational uncertainty. So while there's good agreement, using the observations of heat content at this stage is not tight enough to actually discriminate adequately between models, at least in the, the, the global average ocean <coughs> heat content change. There's uh, hope that that might change. Uh, the Argo array, so these uh, profiling floats, which are floating around the ocean, uh, measuring upper ocean temperature from the surface down to 2,000 metres. Uh, in uh, January 2016, there was 3,900 of these floats roughly evenly distributed around most of the oceans, uh, some gaps particularly in under ice areas and also in some marginal seas. Uh, but this is a, a much higher quality data set, much more uniform global coverage, uh, both spatially and seasonally, uh, and the instruments are much higher quality than XBTs. <coughs> It's not perfect. We do need to be careful of instrumental biases still, and particularly comparison of older XPT data uh, with Argo data, uh, there's likely to be differences in, in biases between those two. Uh, this is uh, an attempt to use that data from 2006, which is essentially when we get global coverage from uh, the start of 2006. You can start to do it from 2005, but there's still um, spatial biases uh, which I think contaminate the record. So starting from 2006, uh, we essentially got global coverage. 
Uh, and this shows the ocean warming, um, the global average warming from three different estimates. Uh, uh, Dean Remix in blue from an optical interpolation. Uh, uh, sorry, Dean Remix in red from an optical interpolation. Our method, method of a reduced space optical interpolation in blue. And uh, Susan Weifel's uh, uh, robust parametric fit in uh, the dashed line. So all showing a significant increase in ocean heat content over this period. And that compares with uh, the changes in surface of surface temperature over the land in grey and over the ocean in red and blue from either Argo or other surface observations, which show much more variability compared to the steady increase in ocean heat content. The panel here shows global average zero to 2,000 metres of changes in ocean heat content. Lots of variability in the surface layers associated with uh, ENSO in particular in the Pacific. Uh, but warming throughout the water column, particularly in this layer here between about 4, 400 metres and uh, 1,800 metres. This panel at the right shows uh, the global integral versus depth warming in the upper part of the water column, uh, but it's quite dependent on the exact period it shows uh, because of the ENSO variability, uh, but a much more consistent warming throughout the water column and if you do a zonal average, almost all of the heat is going into the southern hemisphere oceans, uh, particularly latitudes about 20 to 60 degrees south. Uh, and in the northern hemisphere, it's, it's much smaller. It varies between these three different estimates from uh, the order of 10% to 25% of the heat going into the northern hemisphere, hemisphere oceans. Um, if we add to that estimates uh, for the deep ocean um, and also uh, estimates for the areas not spatially covered by the Argo array uh, and what's going into the lithosphere and the cryosphere, etc., uh, then compared to the IPCC, the CMIP-5 models, um, which are shown by the red and the blue, um, then this is the, unfortunately, very short Argo record, too short to adequately differentiate between these different uh, model simulations, uh, but in general agreement with those observations, so it's an important indicator of ongoing heat uptake by the climate system, and uh, over time, I think it'll be one of the most powerful tools for helping to differentiate between the models and uh, the different scenarios. There's plans to extend Argo into the deep ocean, uh, as shown in the bottom panel here. Uh, there's a prototype flutes now uh, profiling either to 4,000 metres for some instruments or to 6,000 metres for the ocean floor uh, for other instruments. Uh, they're planning for a 5 degree by 5 degree uh, Argo float array versus uh, 3 degrees by 3 degrees for the upper ocean. Uh, but that needs to be supplemented by continuing repeat uh, research ship observations. Here's a network that's been agreed to internationally, uh, which are repeated uh, every five to ten years by, uh, with varying frequencies depending on which line, uh, and they're done by an international consortium uh, under the flagship called GoShip. Uh, so both of these are important for deep ocean observations. Uh, the ship observations also, of course, give us much more different traces, carbon, um, transient traces, freons, etc. Uh, so they're important for more than just ocean heat content. Okay, so I'm going to now move to sea level, uh, about halfway through. Um, so we today live in a coastal society, largely. Uh, about 60 to 150 million people live within one metre of the high, current high water mark. And we're moving ever closer to the coast, both in the developed and the developing nations. Uh, this one example of the Gold Coast from 1958 through to 2007, when the population increased from roughly 40,000 to half a million with about 4 million visitors a year. So 
everywhere around the world, we're moving much more and more to the coastline. But these coastlines are vulnerable, of course. So how has sea level changed in the past? So this is a paleo record or information from a paleo record. We all know, I think, that during the ice ages of the last million years, sea level was the order of 100, more than 100 metres below present day sea levels. Uh, last glacial maximum, more than, 100, more than 130 metres below present day sea levels with major ice sheets on the northern hemisphere continents and a larger Antarctic ice sheet. But the real question is what happens in a warmer climate? And I think the answer is really clear that in warmer climates, sea level was higher. So this is current day values. CO2 has increased from 280 to over 400 parts per million have just gone up about one degree Celsius. You'll look back at the, the last interglacial, the period where we have most, uh, the best evidence for temperatures about one degree, also about pre-industrial, perhaps a little bit more, so only slightly warmer than current day values. And sea levels, uh, well this study has said six to nine, but generally I think of it as somewhere between five and 10 meters higher than present day sea levels at temperatures not much larger than present day values. And you can look back in the history and uh, at previous warm periods and, and have estimates which are less reliable but confirm that during warmer periods, sea level is higher. Uh, what about the instrumental record? Uh, shown here in blue is the tide gauge records and various estimates of the global average sea level from uh, the late 1800s through to, uh, to the present, shown through here. Uh, one estimate from long tide changes, the purple dots are all paleogeological information of sea level change during this period. Uh, and the satellite record is shown right at the end here. So clearly an increase in the rate of rise from 1900 to 1990, uh, the best estimate is about 1.5 millimetres per year. Uh, there's been a recent study which said this is perhaps 20% 20, 20 too large and uh, 1.2 would be a, a better estimate. But clearly an acceleration from the pre-industrial uh, period where rates of sea level change were a few tenths of a millimetre per year at best uh, to just under two millimetres per year during the 20th century and uh, since 1993, when we've had satellite records, both the satellite record and also the in situ uh, tide gauge record shows a larger rate of rise, uh, generally accepted to be 3.2 millimetres per year over this period, uh, but I'll actually revisit this estimate later in the talk. But clearly an acceleration during the period, although there was a period in the mid uh, 20th century, roughly from 1930 to 1950, of larger rates of sea level rise. So what causes sea level to change? Uh, firstly, warming, cooling of the ocean causes thermal expansion, contraction, and that's one of the major contributors to 20th century sea level change and also 21st century uh, sea level change. Uh, changes in mass of the ocean, so thermal expansion is constant mass, just increasing the volume through thermal expansion. Um, changes in mass of the ocean, principally during the 20th century from loss of mass from glaciers around the world. Uh, it turns out actually that glaciers are probably the largest contribution. And also loss of mass or changes of mass with the ice sheets. Uh, and we call this barostatic change because it's a change in mass and also changes in liquids water stored on land. So there's two long-term co contributions to this. Uh, there's the building of dams around the world and the storage of water uh, in those terrestrial reservoirs. But there's also the extraction of water from aquifers, resulting in a depletion of water in these aquifers, uh, counterbalancing the storage of water in dams. Much of that extraction of water, of course, runs off into the ocean, although some of it's some of it makes its way uh, back into the aquifers. So they're the contributions, oh, and there's also climate variations associated 
uh, with things like ENSO, where you can have uh, temporary storage of water on land um, and, and in the atmosphere. Uh, the atmospheric component is large, but the store, temporary storage of water on land can be significant and uh, easily seen in the instrumental record. So these are the issues associated with changes in the global ocean volume. Uh, but of course, what we're interested in is change in relative sea level at the coast. <coughs> of course, the Earth is not solid, as we would like it to be. Uh, it's continually changing, uh, and so we need to measure. We're really interested in relative sea level change, to change in the sea surface height relative to the ocean floor. Uh, and of course, regional sea level uh, can be different from the global average through changes in ocean circulation. So sea level may rise more rapidly in some regions of the globe than others. And of course, satellites actually don't measure either of these constants. Satellites measure sea level with respect to the centre of the Earth, so geocentric sea level. Um, so relative sea level affected by ocean density and ocean circulation, also land movement, and the distribution of mass on Earth can change the gravitational field of the Earth, changing sea level, and also changing the vertical movement of the land. And I'll revisit that shortly. Uh, I've talked enough about thermal expansion and ocean heat uptake. Uh, the second major contribution, as I said, is uh, glaciers. Uh, this shows a various estimate of glacier contributions during the 20th century. Um, they're all uh, tuned uh, to direct observations from Graham Cogley from this period, from roughly 1950 to, the, to the, uh, 2010. And then they're extrapolated back in time using various different techniques. Uh, so the Leclerc uh, observations here in yellow uh, uses the length of, of glaciers uh, around the world uh, to estimate the changes in uh, um, glacier contributions. Uh, ben Marzion uses a, a model of glaciers uh, forced by changes in surface conditions to estimate changes in uh, mass. So the total contribution uh, is roughly uh, eight centimetres during this period uh, with some significant variations between the, the different estimates. Note a period of uh, larger loss of mass during the early 20th century and then a lower rate and then an increased rate again over recent decades. Uh, accelerated uh, loss of mass from the ice sheets has become an important issue over recent decades. Uh, so in Greenland, that's principally from, oh, in Greenland, the surface, increased surface melting uh, contributes to that significantly, shown here. Uh, water flowing off the glacier down to what's called a moulin in the glacier, a hole in, in the ice sheet, down to the base of the ice sheet and then uh, off uh, into the ocean. Uh, and also the increased flow of ice through glaciers, outlet glaciers from the ice sheet in both Greenland and Antarctica, uh, shown here for Greenland, um, resulting in an accelerating contribution um, in Antarctica, surface melting up until recently has really not been a major issue, uh, and it's really been the accelerating flow of glaciers, particularly in the West Antarctic ice sheet uh, into the ocean, which has been of major concern. You can also measure the changes in the ice sheets by uh, several different techniques. Uh, shown here is the estimates from satellite gravity measurements. So you can actually estimate what, how the mass of the ice sheets is changing and also how the mass of the oceans is changing. And so the record starts in about 2003 um, for Greenland. An increasing contribution uh, over this period, it was about uh, 280 gigatons, so that's about a quarter of a millimetre uh, per year from, uh, uh, sorry, three quarters of a millimetre per year from from Greenland and an accelerating component. Um, uh, and this estimate would say it's a, a significant acceleration. Uh, Antarctica, 
a smaller contribution, much more variable, uh, and the, any acceleration is much less clear. Much of the flow in Antarctica comes from the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, which is grounded below sea level, uh, and this allows the potential for a rapidly accelerating flow of ice uh, from the West Antarctic Ice Sheet and portions of the East Antarctic Ice Sheet that are also grounded below sea level, uh, leading to metres of sea level change. And so the question is how quickly uh, that might occur. And that's a major and ongoing controversy. Uh, our ability to simulate sea level change has improved over recent, uh, over the last decade, I guess. All previous reports up till the AR5, IPCC reports up till the AR5, could not adequately simulate the historical sea level change. Uh, that's improved somewhat. Uh, shown here is our estimate from the model simulations in black from 1990 up to the present. Uh, and two observational estimates from satellites in red and from in situ estimates in blue. And so there's approximate agreement over this relatively short period. But this includes the observed dynamic contribution from, from the ice sheets, because uh, there are not historical simulations of the dynamic contributions available to us. If we look over a longer period from 1960 through to the present, uh, again, comparison of the uh, uh, various estimates of the observed sea level change over this period uh, with the model change, again, including the observed dynamic ice sheet contributions, uh, which is only significant, of course, uh, over the recent decades, or thought to be only significant over recent decades, or actually lacking observations earlier in the century, and it's a relatively still over this period a relatively small, but unfortunately a growing contribution. Uh, and this is uh, where we really stand in terms of attributing sea level to the various drivers of what might be causing sea level change. Uh, this is shown as a fraction, uh, the natural uh, contribution from natural variability of the observed value uh, so this is all the different CMIC-5 models, including thermal expansion, glaciers, surface mass balance of both ice sheets. Uh, and that's only about, at most, 20% of the change over this period uh, from 1900 to 2000. There's a contribution here which is associated with historical changes in, in glaciers, so the glaciers were out of equilibrium following the Little Ice Age conditions, and they contributed the larger component in the first half of the 20th century, and I pointed out earlier, I think, a larger rate of rise during that period from 1920 to 1950, uh, but that contribution has decayed and uh, is small by the latter decades of the 20th century. Our Total ability to simulate sea level as a fraction of the uh, historical observations. So in the early part of the 20th century, we do quite well as we do in the latter part of the 20th century. But there's this period in the middle part of the 20th century uh, where the uh, model change is less than several estimates of the observed change. Uh, and that's where the new sea level estimate of Hayatel may become important. Uh, because they actually have a smaller estimate of rate of sea level change from observations during this period. And the final panel I really wanted to point out here is a fraction of anthropogenic change. Uh, so again, ocean thermal expansion, glacier contribution, surface mass balance of, uh, from the ice sheets. Uh, and that increases from roughly uh, less than 25% up to 2050. Uh, from about 1970, it increases rapidly, or from 1970, it's a dominant contribution, contributing about 70% uh, of the observed change over recent decades. The reason why it's not 100%, of course, is the anthropogenic activity is associated with water storage, uh, extraction of water from aquifers um, is not included uh, in this uh, anthropogenic component here.
I said I would revisit the satellite altimeter record, uh, and this shows a paper just about to come out, come out next, early next week. Um, this is the estimate of ocean thermal expansion in blue uh, in global average over the period from 93 to 2013. Uh, roughly a millimetre per year, some variability associated with that. The next component is uh, from glaciers, showing a slightly increasing trend over the period, uh, but again, something like 0.8 of a millimetre uh, per year from, uh, the, um, from the glaciers. Uh, terrestrial water storage increasing gradually, gradually because we're extracting more water from, from <coughs> aquifers over time for irrigation, for water supply, etc. And we're building fewer dams and perhaps those dams are also silting up uh, such that they're storing less water over time. Um, the Antarctic ice sheet, but the big one here is the Greenland ice sheet which goes from something like a couple of tenths of a millimetre per year at the start of the record up to about 0.8 of a millimetre per year at the end of the record. So a very significant increase in the contribution from the Greenland ice sheet and it's principally uh, increased surface melting of the ice sheet over, over the time. So that shows an increase in the rate of sea level from roughly 2.2 up to uh, 3.2 three millimetres per year over this period. Uh, the historical, sort of the, the accepted satellite record from the Topix Poseidon uh, and Jason series of satellite altimeters, which are measuring global sea level, uh, is shown by uh, the grey dotted lines here. Uh, a couple of years ago, Chris Watson uh, and our group in Hobart uh, argued that there was a significant bias in the early part of this record, in the first six years of the record, of almost a millimetre per year. And when you actually adjust the record for these biases, you get uh, the black dotted lines, the black dots through here, in approximate agreement with the sum of the terms. So both of these uh, indications now are for an accelerating contribution uh, an accelerating sea level rise during the satellite period, which was not the case before, uh, with most of that acceleration coming from an accelerating contribution from the Greenland ice sheet. Um, okay, what about projections of sea level? So these are the projections in the AR5 from uh, 2005 or 2006 uh, through to 2100. Uh, for RCP 8.5, so for unmitigated greenhouse gas emissions for, and for RCP 2.6 for significant reduction and stabilizations of emissions. Um, for RCP 2.6, the rate of rise increases during the early parts of the 21st century, uh, then steadies and actually falls slightly by the end of the 21st century. Uh, in contrast, RCP 8.5 uh, with unmitigated emissions accelerates throughout the 20th century uh, with the range of sea level projected to be somewhere between half a metre and one metre uh, by 2100. And this is what is termed uh, in the AR5 the likely range of con containing 66% of the probabilities. Um, the rate of change in the last decades of the 20th century are somewhere in the range 8 to 16 millimetres per year. This is much larger than we experience now. It's roughly equivalent to the last major deglaciation of the Earth uh, after the last ice age when sea levels rose at more than a metre per century for many thousands of years. Uh, a few comments about this. Uh, in contrast to surface temperatures where the surface temperature is proportional to the total greenhouse gas emissions, Early emissions of greenhouse gases lead to larger sea level rise. Uh, the largest contribution are thermal expansion, glaciers, then the Greenland surface mass balance, and the Antarctic and Greenland dynamics. At the time of this report, we didn't have enough information to allow us to differentiate between the different scenarios for the uh, Antarctic dynamical contribution 
uh, or for changes in the land storage. So both of these terms are likely to be scenario dependent, but we didn't have enough information to allow us to adequately quantify that, that differentiation. We also recognise that there was a potential for a larger contribution of sea level rise than allowed for in the central, uh, central projections I just talked about. And that's really associated with the Antarctic ice sheet. The Antarctic ice sheet remains, I think, one of the major uncertainties, both in climate change and also in sea level change. Uh, two issues. Much of West Antarctica and significant parts of East Antarctica are grounded below sea level. So the equivalent of um, more than 10 metres of sea level grounded below sea level with the bedrock getting deeper as you go back from the ocean. This allows for potential for an instability, warm water penetrating underneath the ice shelf here, floating out over the ocean, melting the ice shelf at its base and causing this grounding line to retreat. That results in a, a greater flow of ice across the grounding line because it's so much deeper and an accelerated loss of ice from the Antarctic ice sheet. When it's in this situation, when the grounding line gets on this reverse slope, it's unstable, so it either has to advance or retreat, uh, unless there are other stabilising factors. <coughs> a second mechanism, so, so this is a, a, a mechanism that has been studied to some extent, has been incorporated in some recent studies, <coughs> and, and those studies in fact suggest that in parts of West Antarctica, we have already uh, entered a, a regime where we have an ongoing instability of parts of the West Antarctic ice sheet. The what the contribution will be through 2100 and beyond uh, is unclear. Though. There's a second mechanism which has become prominent uh, recently, and that's the collapse of ice shelves through both surface warming, allowing melt ponds to form on the uh, ice shelf, those melt ponds penetrating through the glacier, refreezing, opening up the glacier, uh, and forming icebergs, uh, and ultimately the collapse of ice shelves. We've seen this happen on the Antarctic Peninsula where uh, the Larsen B ice shelf uh, disintegrated in, in just a matter of weeks that resulted in the, an increased flow of ice into the ocean from the uh, glaciers behind the, the ice shelf. Uh, and recent studies, uh, there's one recent study I'll show in a moment, uh, has introduced this phenomena together with an associated phenomena of collapse of, of resultant cliffs uh, at the edge of the ice sheet results in a significant uh, increased flow. So we recognised that this was an important phenomenon. Um, our estimate was that it was unlikely to exceed several tenths of a metre during the 21st century without really knowing what several meant. Uh, if you read the literature, uh, it says uh, perhaps up to 0 0.6 of a metre by 2100, uh, but we actually thought probably less than that, but we weren't really sure. And certainly, Current evidence does not uh, adequately allow us to determine what the magnitude of that is on the longer time, on the time frame, on a multi-century time frame. So there's been a whole series of uh, ice sheet studies published since then. Uh, most of them are mostly actually consistent with the AR5 results uh, as shown. Uh, and this shows uh, one, I think, which is a, an important study. Uh, by Catherine Ritz uh, and Tamsin uh, uh, Edwards uh, and others. And what they did was, let's artificially collapse all the ice shelves around Antarctica and stimulate the ice, ice sheet to see how quickly we can get it to flow in, into the ocean. Uh, and they did many, many uh, hundreds of simulations. Uh, and perhaps just focusing here on the probability distribution function, uh, by 2100, so their central estimate was around 10, 12 centimetres 
uh, which is about what we used in, in the AR5, perhaps marginally higher, but not very much. But what they did do is manage to start to um, quantify the tails of the probability distribution, which is something we chose not to do in the AR5 because we didn't think we had enough information. By 2200, uh, there's a bimodal distribution uh, with significant rise out here at, at 60 centimetres. And there's one re very recent study which is in um, projecting a much larger rate of contribution from the Antarctic ice sheet uh, than Ritz et al. or any of the other studies. Uh, that's the Consler and Pollard, which was published last year in, uh, in Nature. Uh, and they're projecting, uh, so they've tuned their model to a Pliocene target where sea levels were 10 to 20 metres higher than current values. Uh, and when they do that, uh, their simulations for RCP 8.5 are for the order of a metre of sea level by 2100 from Antarctica alone. So this is significantly larger uh, than all previous projections. It's very temperature dependent. So for RCP uh, 2.6, they're essentially quite a small contribution by 2100. Uh, so it really stresses, I think, the importance of mitigation of climate. It's also sensitive to the tuning of that model. So if you tune it to a 5 to 15 metre uh, Pliocene target rather than 10 to 20, uh, then you're down to about 60 centimetres for the Antarctic ice contribution by 2100, roughly similar uh, to what we did in the AR5. But note that on the longer time frame, there's very large contributions. So you know you're talking about 13 metres here for RCP 8.5. So this is going to be a great major issue. Uh, so that's by 2500. Uh, it's going to be a major issue. I think there's almost uniform agreement that Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets for unmitigated greenhouse gas emissions are going to contribute metres to sea level rise. The argument is how quickly that will occur. Uh, so these were estimates we made in the last report. Uh, there's insufficient model simulations to allow us to do quantitative estimates of probabilities as we did up to 2100. Um, we've divided into high emission scenarios, medium and low, and just focusing on the red bars here from present day up to 2500, it's only with major mitigation that it would be possible to maintain emission, uh, maintain sea level rises below a metre. For the high emission scenarios, we were talking about sea level rises up to seven metres by 2500, and of course the De Conto and Pollard would add significantly to that. Um, these estimates are likely to systematically underestimate uh, the amount of sea level change over this period because they underestimate the Antarctic con contribution as De Conto and Pollard has recently demonstrated. Um, okay, I'm not quite finished. Uh, what, what time do you want me to finish, Melissa? Um, that's okay, you can go uh, much further from any point. No, not, not that much. Yeah, yeah, keep going, it's fine. Keep okay, going. Uh, so <laughs> sea level rise is not uniform. This shows the satellite act, uh, altimeter record from 93 to 2015. Uh, the average, global average, is about three millimetres per year. Uh, but in the Western Pacific here, you're talking about regions of three times that global average, 10 millimetres per year and that's having significant impact in those regions. Uh, and uh, close to zero uh, sea level rise uh, in the Eastern Pacific. That's primarily a result of natural variability uh, rather than a, a, an indicator of the pattern of sea level change. Although well, there are some indications in this record that are consistent with uh, the pattern that we get from climate change simulations uh, which I'll come to in a, in a moment. <coughs> so we're interested in relative sea level change at the coast, of course. The Earth is not solid. If you take mass from the ice sheets and put it into the ocean, you're decreasing the load on that part of the Earth, 
the Earth rebounds, you're increasing the load uh, over the ocean, and the ocean floor sinks. Uh, but you're also changing the gravitational field of the Earth as well. And so water that was originally attracted to the ice sheet flows away from the ice sheet. And so you actually get a fall in sea level right next to the region of mass loss and a larger than global average sea level rise uh, in the far field. Uh, and of course, there's a dynamic response of the ocean uh, to a changing climate, so changes in winds, changes in surface, air, sea, uh, heat, and freshwater fluxes. And that results in this pattern here. This region of high sea levels at about 30 to 40 degrees south, uh, right around the globe in the southern hemisphere, and also uh, similar patterns in the northern hemisphere. So this is an expansion of the subtropical gyres uh, of the ocean uh, in both hemispheres. Uh, a lower than average rate of rise south of the Antarctic circumpolar current of course, these are coarse resolution models, so they're not adequately resolved in the eddies. Uh, so whether higher resolution models will also simulate this uh, is less clear. And then we've got these fingerprints associated with, firstly, in the top panel here, ongoing movement of the Earth as a result of large changes in mass distribution since the last glacial maximum, and also the fingerprints associated with the ongoing present-day changes in mass uh, from the loss of glaciers, so uh, a, a negative contribution to sea level rate rise in the region where you're losing mass from glaciers, and a larger than global average rise in the far field by up to about 20 to 30 percent. Uh, and similarly for the ice sheets, sea level fall near the regions of ice mass loss, Greenland and West Antarctica, and larger than global average sea level in the far field. So you need to bring all of these components together to project regional sea levels rise, and that's what's shown here. Uh, it turns out that for about 95% of the ocean, uh, sea level will experience a sea level rise. And for much of the coastline, particularly if you exclude the high latitude regions, uh, then much of the, the uh, sea level rise experience at the coastline will be in about 20% of the global V global mean change. You can, uh, we have of course done regional projections of sea level change, this just shows the example for Australia, and you can bring that down to the specific locations, so these are the projections for Port Kembla just south of here, uh, for the four different scenarios, and the observational record in black uh, up to a couple of years ago. Um, okay, so finish off. Uh, just a few summary points. Uh, ocean heat content is really a critical element for understanding the Earth's uh, response to climate change. It's also critical for uh, understanding sea level change. Um, hopefully the Argo array in uh, a few years' time will allow a much better estimate of ocean heat content changes and more thorough evaluation of climate model simulations. Uh, unequivocal warming of the, of the ocean. Uh, estimates are consistent with the CMO5 models, but there's a very large spread. Uh, sea levels continue to rise, and I would argue now has accelerated through the satellite record. Um, thermal expansion and glaciers are the major contributions, but with a growing contribution from the ice sheets, both from Greenland and Antarctica. Anthropogenic activities dominates that sea level contribution over recent decades. Um, uh, heat content, again, we need a, a framework for understanding that, uh, and it's a critical measure of the efficacy of our, our mitigation measures into the future. But there are long-term issues with, sea, with ocean heat content, sea level, uh, which means mitigation is really urgent, but also Adaptation will be essential for the world. And I should stop there.
So you mentioned that the liquid storage on land also contributes to sea levels. And I was just wondering, particularly changes in the hydrological cycle and, and water storage in aquifers and dams, if anyone's tried to predict how that might change in the future and see how that might contribute in addition to the ice sheets to the sea level. Yeah. Yeah, so there are projections of that. Um, so it, it's dependent on both the climate, but also many other socioeconomic factors as well. So, you know, climate's hard, but doing those other socioeconomic factors is even more difficult. Uh, but there are some projections. They're limited in the length of time that they, they're done for, and uh, how robust they are, I don't know. Um, yeah, so I gave the number in terms of watts per square metre. I was wondering in terms of degrees Celsius. Um, sorry, I don't have it on the top of my head. But I guess it's on that slide, so we could go back and have a look at that if you like. I also have one other question. When you hmm. mentioned that the satellite record was biased for the first six years, hmm. and I was wondering what that bias was due to. Uh, so that's a, that's a major issue. So. Um, when we published the, uh, the bias, you know, people didn't like the results. Satellite data was perfect. Uh, particularly the Topix Poseidon altimeter was, you know, the best instrument we've ever had, sort of thing. And coming along and saying, well, wait a minute, we've got a problem, uh, people weren't happy about. Um, we think it's associated with an algorithm that's associated with the sea surface bias. So the surface of the ocean is not flat, so you, you're sending a radar pulse from the satellite down to the ocean surface, it's reflecting back. It reflects better from the, the, the troughs of waves than it does from the surface of waves. Um, it depends on the wave height. Um, the, the beam is not a narrow beam, it's got a finite angle on it. So there's a whole lot of issues associated with that and the algorithms and how you do that correction. So it's thought to be associated with one of those algorithms and I'm expecting a paper to come out on that uh, in the next few months. But, yeah, that's... So it was an early algorithm and then it was updated or...? Um, the, the JSON altimeters are slightly different to the Topix altimeters. So, I th so essentially, I think you're you're right. There was a different algorithm used on Jason than on uh, Topix. Yep. Um, I just wonder what kind of observations are you used would be ideal to get a get a grasp of the changes in ice mass and melting over Antarctica. Uh, so. The satellite gravity measurements, measurements are really important. Uh, so that's the GRACE mission and uh, the GRACE follow-on mission, which is due for launch, not quite sure when, but not too far away. Uh, that has limited resolution, so it'd be nice to have greater spatial resolution. Uh, and there's uh, experimental instruments on the next satellite which should allow greater spatial resolution. Uh, it's also measured by uh, the inflow-outflow method, so they can measure the flow of ice across the glacier, across the grounding line. Um, so you need to calculate the velocity, you need to estimate what the, what the depth of the ice is at that location, and then you balance that with how much, how much snowfall is occurring uh, on the uh, ice sheet. Uh, and thirdly, you can measure, you can estimate it from uh, satellite altimeter measurements, just how high is the ice. Uh, but of course, uh, particularly in Antarctica, the land is also moving. And so what are you measuring? Are you measuring the land or are you measuring the ice? Uh, and you need to be able to separate those, those two terms. And that's particularly important in East Antarctica, where, where we expect increased accumulation from a warming climate to offset some of the contributions from uh, 
other contributions to sea level. Uh, but this issue of ongoing glacial isostatic adjustment uh, is a, one of a significant uncertainty in that. So there's those three methods which people are using. Um, was there a second part? Um, no, no, that's it. Okay. There's a question up the back here somewhere. Uh, I was wondering, uh, why is there no sea level rise around Antarctic Peninsula uh, in front of the uh, So it's associated with this changes in gravitational attraction. When you take mass from that region and shift it elsewhere, you decrease the gravitational attraction and water flows away from the Antarctic Peninsula to other parts of the ocean. So you get a larger than global average sea level rise elsewhere in the ocean and a fall there. And I think there's a question behind you. Oh, no, that's okay. No? Yep. What do you think for the heat content of the oceans? We saw the figure that showed that it's mostly taken up by the southern hemisphere oceans and maybe with the mid latitudes. Uh, there's a component in, in the tropics too, I think. And, and yeah, it's the mid latitudes, 20 to 60 south. So I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand why, why, it would be, why it would be located mostly there. Um, I think it's not adequately um, understood either, um, but perhaps one of my modelling colleagues might be able to help me out here. Um, it's also a, a contribution to that is associated with the large-scale overturning circulation of the ocean. Uh, the strong westerly winds transporting heat northwards and into the ocean basin and being uh, returned from by water at, at colder water at depth. So that's one of the, the keys to that, the large-scale overturning circulation of the ocean. Um, I've always wondered whether the aerosols, which are predominantly a northern hemisphere issue, also contributes to that. Um, yeah. I think it's I think it's a good question to, to ask and I don't have the answer. Sorry, I just gotta um, make a comment about the the danger to people, you know, with such a large number of people living in coastal areas. Um, I was wondering about comparative danger to those people <laughs> from sea level rise, absolute sea level rise as opposed to heat content in local areas causing storm surges and things like that. Is there any kind of um, projection of immediate danger to people based on those two things? Uh, well, of course, um, people are impacted by the extreme events. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's always the case. Uh, but rising sea levels allow those extreme events to be higher and values going over a certain threshold occur more frequently. So on the east and west coast of Australia, for example, we've already seen extreme sea levels above a certain threshold increase by a factor of three during the 20th century. And that will increase into the future. Higher sea levels allow storm surges to propagate further inland, allow coast, more coastal erosion. So I don't think you can weigh these things up as being distinct like extreme events is how you're going to feel sea level change and, and much of climate change through those extreme events. As to estimates of people, um, yes, there are some estimates. They're pretty rubbery, but the numbers are large. Yep. Um, I'm wondering, I know our floors we have temperature from five meters to 2,000 meters. But it does flow to the surface to send the signal. So why don't we have the temperature of the upper five meters? Uh, so I think probably the sensors at the bottom of the instrument, so that's a meter or two, uh, but it's also a contamination issue for the sensors. So you want to make highly accurate salinity measurements in particular. And so when they get very close to the surface, I think they turn the pumps off so that uh, surface rubbish, oils, etc. don't contaminate the sensors. I'm not the expert there, but... Uh, I think I think that's less of an issue, but... I just had, so, yep. Um, you said that the rate of change was maybe at the end of the century, 8 to 16 millimetres, 
but that, so that's comparable to the last week glaciation, which is pretty impressive. Yes, but absolutely. That's not, but the rate of the rate of change, so the increase in the rate of change would be probably more. Ah, yes, that's, that's probably true too. So, yeah. we do the projections out to 2,100. What's your feeling for the momentum of the system for the next, going past 2,100, maybe 3,000? Um, yeah, un unless we do pretty urgent mitigation, uh, there's a lot of momentum in the system. There's a threshold for melting of the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, which we will cross during this century. Um, we didn't quantify that very well in the last report. Um, we said well, between one degrees and four degrees Celsius above pre-industrial, or already one degree Celsius above pre-industrial. So how close are we to that threshold? Um, I suspect it's substantially less than four degrees Celsius. That's the order of seven metres of sea level in Greenland. It's a slow process, so it's an order of millennia, but, you know, there's momentum there for it to happen. There's momentum in the ice sheets and also thermal expansion. Uh, are there any prominent pathways for the deep ocean heat uptake or deep ocean heat transfer? Are there any what? Uh, prominent pathways for the deep ocean heat transfer. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the deep parts of the ocean are ventilated from very high latitudes, particularly in the southern hemisphere, uh, uh, southern ocean, and also the North Atlantic. Predominantly not in the Pacific and not, not in the Indian. But so it's the North Atlantic and the, the southern ocean are the, the areas to look. And we've seen that in the uptake of heat in, in the uh, um, Greg Johnson uh, map with most of that heat penetrating northward from the Southern Ocean.